When the wind blows cold on the shores of Lake Erie, the Queen City moans her sad, lonely song. Her streets are empty, but for handfuls of scattered souls, scurrying to escape the chill. Most are gathered at the warm watering holes that garnish every street corner, offering respite for the weary. The air hangs thick and is warmed by the hot takes that resound from the wooden walls. We find ourselves on the doorstep of such a place, with the champions of mediocrity about to set off on another long-winded journey. The windows are already beginning to fog with the barmy bloviations. As the door creaks open, a rush of warm air ushers the velvet voices of the 716 Sports Podcast. Hello, welcome back to another lovely episode of the 716 Sports Cod... Codpast. Codpast. <laughs> Bringing back the Codpast. Great yeah. start. <laughs> welcome back to the Codpast. What's up, Jeff? What's going on, Justin? What's up, Steve? What's up, Justin? Well, what kind of gum are you chewing? I, I spit it out so I didn't chew into the microphone, but it was Orbit Spearmint. Mm. Number one in the, the gum world, in my opinion. Is that, a, is that your top of your gum power rankings? Yes. Is that one of our evergreen shows for the summer as we record our uh, our favorite gum takes? Sure. Perfect. I okay. know what we should talk about today. The the rousing sports news in Western New York. Two happenings now I think that we need to talk about. One would be LeBron James signing with the Lakers. And two would be DeMarcus Cousins signing with the Warriors. Uh, Justin really wants to talk about both of those things. Um, and that's the extent of our basketball conversation here tonight. <laughs> basketball is Where's canceled. Bill? Everyone go home. None of it matters. The Warriors have unlimited money, and they don't care that they're going into the luxury tax because they're going to keep winning championships. They already are in the luxury tax. I don't know how it works, but they're going to pay a half billion dollars in luxury tax because of the CBA. And they'll make it all back because they're They already made it back yesterday because of, you know, how good they are. So I hope hope the Lakers enjoyed their one day of relevance in the Western Conference before they got banished. But they got JaVale McGee, you said. They did get JaVale and McGee. That's the extent of our basketball talk. <laughs> Justin is trying so hard, <laughs> trying to, so hard to shuffle kiboshes. us into, uh, into the hockey portion of the show, which will be significantly longer, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so, not to be buried between those basketball signings, uh, we were wondering over the weekend if we are going to have something to talk about really to record when free agency started, then a couple big things happened. Uh, in order that they did happen, the Sabres' biggest rival acquires the biggest piece in free agency, and then the Sabres unload one of their biggest contracts for two roster players, two draft picks, a prospect in the Ryan O'Reilly era that began, felt like not so long ago. He gets brought in alongside the Jack Eichel draft to become a key piece of the future. He's around here for a couple of years, loses all favor, with, apparently with his coaches, with his teammates, with the fans, and... Off to St. Louis it goes. You look at the deal, the way that Tim Murray structured it because of the signing bonuses due on July 1st, it makes it very difficult to trade him because you have to write him a check for, what is it, $7.5 million on July 1st. So, you know, the Sabres aren't going to want to trade him after they've paid him that because they physically, I know the cap figures count, but the reality is you've written him a check for seven and a half million dollars you don't want to part ways with that guy and then when you're trying to trade him to a team they don't want to be on the hook to write this guy a check for seven and a half million dollars and guess what they They did it they found a taker and the return and i think we had various degrees of excitement with it i'm kind of on the fence about it Mm -hmm. justin i know you were kind of vocally displeased kind of justin was very (laughs) vocally displeased about it more so in our slack group right he had well, I mean, you have to you have to vent it out when it happens. So let, let, let's start with that. Today, now roughly twenty four hours removed from the trade, has your fe- have your feelings changed? And Do you like it better? Just Are you to in preface the same this, Jeff, where you were? Justin and I did not talk about this before on purpose because I wanted it to be raw. So for if you're listening, this is raw. None of us have talked about this other than via our Slack him all chat all day at work. Yes. So now I want to hear the raw Justin take on the Ryan O'Reilly trade. I was more mad about it last night. I'm not mad anymore. If I was mad, you would have got some hot shit coming out of this microphone. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, just feel like I know I know we're, we're rebuilding, and I wasn't expecting the team to go to the playoffs next year, but I just feel I just want the team to be better than last year. And I think that trade made them worse than last year. They went to slow, aging wingers. Meanwhile, like the first three lines are full of old, Freaking turds, besides Eichel, Sheary, and Reinhardt. And then 
and you got all these slow old guys, and there's this Bailey Baptiste and you know C.J. Smith. There's no room for them right now. And you, and you played, and you got I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. I'm so angry. I got the 14 things going through my head right now. It doesn't come up. It's like, I just think the team was, I think that trade made the Sabres worse than last year. I, I, yeah. Brandon Rather brings a lot to the table in terms of two way hockey. He's very good defensively. And now you're number two center. Your number two center is probably now Casey Bert, Middlestat. Or Berglund. He's a center. You want Casey Middlestat so playing number, so number so two role Berglund. right now? Well, what, what's a number two role versus a number three role? Is a number two role a more offensive center and a number three role a more defensive-minded center? Your second, uh, your, all, your number matchup. two center, though, is going to play power play one. Know that because Eichel's going to play the point, I think. I just I don't think Darlene well, changes you're, that. You're, again, with your power play, though, you're not structuring your power play. like You don't write down your depth chart. Like, okay, center number one is over here, so center number two, if Berglund or Sabatka or Gergensen's or XYZ person is better than Middlestad on the first power play, then they want to mix it up. Sure. They're, they're not beholden to playing Casey at the number one center, even though I think it is likely that maybe Sam Reinhardt plays center right. number one on the power play. My, maybe XYZ thing happens. My point to that was not all teams have a center playing the point. Oh, that's right. And Buffalo true. does, and that's why like it's it's obvious that in some cases, like Crosby's not playing the point. Kessel does if he stays there, but yeah. Crosby's your power play one center that's going to take the draw and be your sentiment on the power play. Yeah. And Buffalo is in a little bit of a unique spot. There are a few centers. I'm trying to think like Sam Coase, I think, plays the point. Um, Ovechkin does, but he's not a centerman. So, like, I'm trying to think of, of centermen that play the point on the power play. Well, also, a lot of these number one centers are a little bit better on faceoffs than Jack. If there's sure. one drawback to you want to win that offensive yeah. zone draw to start the power play, and certainly a lot of room to grow for him. I don't think it's a lost cause, but Jack struggled, especially with the new faceoff rules last year, seemed to be very thrown yeah. off by it. And that's where you may, may miss O'Reilly on the power play, especially. But. Being a number two or number three center, whether it's Berglund or Middlestat or whoever they decide to slot in there, Larson, whoever, yeah. it's it's all matchups. Your sure. number one center is your number one center. That's your top line. That's the line that gets the most minutes. But a number two center versus a number three center, maybe it's a minute or two um, more a night. I see. I have Middlestat down as my second center. So I don't know who I'm talking sure. about. I made lines earlier really working. I was bored. Yeah, there's so. a lot of lot of blahs. But I have, yeah, I have Middlestat number two center. But I mean, you you're looking at Ryan O'Reilly, who is probably your top line center. In terms of you know, defense and all that, mm-hmm. and then Eichel, You're, and, and Eichel and middle stat is not the same as O'Reilly and and, and Ryan um, O'Reilly because you're missing a lot on the defensive side because of you you lost O'Reilly. I, I middle think... stat is not going to bring you all the defense that yeah. O'Reilly could. Neither is no. Eichel. Eichel's not. No, still... they're definitely more offensively mm-hmm. yeah. minded, fast centers. But Eichel they're... still struggles yeah. a lot in his own yeah. zone. So he's losing a lot. In that aspect with O'Reilly, and that's why I think they're very oh, a lot, not a lot worse, but they're worse. Well, I don't think there's any argument that Ryan O'Reilly was the best individual sure. player in that trade. Like St. Louis would not have given him that much money. Everyone you talk to will say that O'Reilly was the best individual player in that trade. If you are Jason Botterill, you see a player who we don't know everything that goes on behind the scenes, whether he gets along well with teammates or how much he really wanted out. If you have a hint that a player does not want to be part of this team rebuilding, if he's already unhappy and you might be a year or two away still from really competing, and you can get a decent haul for him. And they had their feet to the fire, too. You talk about that bonus that would have gotten paid at midnight last night. It's get this guy out of here now or don't get him out of here. And yeah. Maybe you're upset that they don't get Thomas or Cairo from St. Louis instead of Thompson. Right. But at the same time, St. Louis knows that Buffalo needs to get rid of this guy now or they're just not going to. And t- to Justin, to... Like, I did not want O'Reilly traded, and when I found out that he was, the way it came out, the cryptic way we found out was LeBron saying O'Reilly to the Blues. We didn't know what was coming back, and immediately you're thinking Thomas or, you know, what what kind of deal did they get? Pareko, I'm glad it wasn't Pareko, to be clear. The only defenseman I'd want from St. Louis is Petrangelo, and, but anyways. Um, but when you look at it's a matter of shifting focus, yeah, I agree. They got worse on paper by with Saboka. Is it Sabotka, Sabotka, Sobotka, Sobotka? I, but anyways, they got worse on paper. I would agree with that. But when you look at Tage Thompson and you look at another first-round pick, we were talking now, they may have three first-round picks in 2019. They're own the Sharks, and if the Blues are not a top-10 top pick. Top-10 protected. Correct. Yeah. They have three picks. And when you start to look at that as what they got in return, a, a blue-chip prospect, a number, you know, a, a first-round pick, and a second round pick and you realize that Saboka and Berglund was more salary related they traded back about seven and a half million to Buffalo all that like to me it's like okay they got a prospect another first round pick which Justin and I hope both and I both of us hope gets moved that they would package up these first round picks for an asset um 
But when you look at it that way, I don't know how they could have. I don't know how they could have done better than they did as far as value coming back. I'm just not. I'm not. So I'm, just, I'm not mad that O'Reilly was traded. I'm not a fan of the return. Yeah. And I forget. I, I kind of let the first round pick up at the wayside. I forget they have three now, and they could pack those up together and get a, a good asset, or even just have three picks in that draft. But those are three players not going to see for another three, four years. They were already talking about packaging them up for Hughes. If you but, could get up to one with one with three picks. I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of the return. You got a bunch of you got 30 year old overpaid players, sure. and they, they don't produce much, and they're not. They, the thing, the thing this, te- this team lacks is speed, and they're not. Those guys aren't bringing speed, right. so they got well, slower. They lack two things, which are st- speed and depth. Yeah, maybe and, and you, maybe you answer to your depth a little bit. Well, and scoring period. Scoring is part of that. S- someone scoring is sure. because no one plays fast to play with their fast players, sure. and there's no one on your third or fourth line to score. Someone so, pointed out that like Connor Sherry only had what 18 goals last year. That would have made him third on the team. <laughs> he would have been behind Jack and cool. Sam, and that's it as far as goals for Evander. But he left. But like you know, you want to talk about how few goals. I mean, Saboka had a career year which was 11 goals, which is not many. But if you look at the goals that the Sabers got from their bottom six virtually none so if Zabotka slides in as a third line winger and scores 11 goals that's more bottom six production than they got from anyone else I think yeah. that might be 100 percent true too like not a guess I don't think their bottom six had anybody score 11 goals Justin if I can guess I think part of your frustration comes in from the fact that we've now reached the point in the rebuild where we've restarted the rebuild and now we feel like we're no closer to being in the playoffs than we were when this whole thing kicked off back with the Eichel draft the tank year before that and now you're talking about assets first round picks who i mean none of these guys usually are dalene they don't usually come in day one and become good nhl players these first round picks if we're not picking top five again there's not a dominant player you said three to four years that's more time you're waiting i feel like part of your frustration is coming from the fact that we're waiting for things we don't have good prospects good players coming back that can contribute to this team this year and this team this year is worse i have the patience to wait for them to be good in three four years but i just want to see a better team than last in the past two seasons because they're pitiful they're awful to watch i just want an interesting fun team and I want to see him. I don't want to see him get let up for forty-five shots every night. Yeah, you know what I mean. Can you? Can that's you? All like, and I just think the the Riley trade just made him worse, and that's what I was pissed about. And the team needs like a, a fast, or not even say fast, a speedy, skilled young winger, and they got a six-foot-five guy who's not very fast. I mean, he's a center. He's too. got good footwork for a six-foot-five guy. I, I, is he center? I hear he's a center. I yes. see on a hockey team. He's a center. I keep people, see, people call him a wing. I don't know what he I plays think he's anymore. A played all three, yeah, but he is, <laughs> that's right. So, but just to advocate, and this is, I know it's not related, and I know it's not, but when the, when the Bills traded Watkins and Darby, it felt like, what are they doing? And they're getting these draft picks back, and they're getting, and then somehow, I mean, it, it's, it's a matter, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's a matter on if you buy into the chemistry stuff. If you think the chemistry stuff is bullshit, then you're, they're worse on paper. But if there is something to the chemistry, this was an addition by subtraction. You remove someone that was part of the problem. Maybe they are better this year because they don't have their seven and a half million dollar guy pissed off in the locker room all the time about how shitty the players are around him. And if you eliminate that, did they get better? I don't know. I'm not saying I buy into or subscribe to the chemistry thing carrying that much weight. But I'm just being, I said at the beginning, I'm just being the advocate here. Maybe they are better. And what I said, Justin was actually texting me last night and how much they're lacking speed. They've gained some speed on the blue line. Darlene alone gives them more speed on the blue line, like and that team. can cover some sins. When you have when you have Darlene playing 28 minutes a night, or maybe not yeah. right away, but, not right, but, but when you have a number one defenseman that can play 28 minutes a night with that kind of speed, that will nullify or that will cover up the lack of speed that a winger might have. And Ideally, you'd like to have both, right? But at least they're not slow up front and still slow on the back end that you know Darlene they, I saw a gif of Darlene breaking out with a one hand on a stick he kind of took the puck in the corner scooped fancy. it out on his backhand with one hand and beat the beat the four checker and got the puck out of his own end with one hand and someone said that hasn't happened in eight years in Buffalo yeah, you know to have that, a guy be able to haul the puck out of his own end with one hand so the, the one-handed pass is better than every single two in a pass last yeah. year so it's, yep. what it was. it's the most it's the most exciting defensive play since Tyler Myers rookie year yes <laughs> I, mean, I think it could come in and play a second line D sure. to start. It's going gonna, gonna to be Risto, Scandella, and then Darlene and McCabe. I still Bogo, think Scandella is a really I nice player. I like Scandella. I feel like you kind of want to put Scandella with Darlene. Sure. But that's veteran, two lefties together, veteran, though. A veteran presence. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, it's up to them how much they want to put him on their offsides. Yeah. What's Bogo? 
righty. Right. So you, you have you want- your righties are Risto, uh, Nelson, um, Gooley. Gooley's left. Risto, uh, Nelson, Bogosian is a righty. Um, so you, you want you want to go Dowling Bogo then probably yeah. you want we want a veteran guy next to him. You yeah. want Gooley next to him, go or or Nelson. Mm-hmm. I want Nelson Gooley still though. Oh yeah. No, but Nelson, nice if, if those pairs all work, I like the defense a lot. When, when you Nelson's flesh it out like this with Darlene officially here, Darlene with Bogosian, if Bogosian is healthy, I think he contributes well. If he's healthy, that's just been his issue with all, being on the All ice. of a sudden, guys like Puglio become expendable. And they, he came in, you know, they traded for him, and he came in with a burden on his shoulders, and he wasn't very good. And now, mm-hmm. I, I like it. Like, they have nine guys. If you want to include, like, Pilot. And you want to include Pilot's Nelson, to look very good Nelson, the McKay, Bulio, Bogo. All of a sudden, you're at nine NHL defensemen, which is a good problem to have. Think, That's not including Hickey. I, I think mean, Pilot finds a way, finds himself away on this team in this, this season. My my buddy ha, so my buddy Eric has Bogo as number seven. Yeah, as Bogosian as a seventh defenseman, the thing is which it would p- suck to pay a seventh defenseman five million dollars for the next two years. Well, it's been sucking to pay him to sit in the press box the last two years. <sighs> What's the difference? If he's healthy, he's so he's he's, he's good. good. He's a nice player. It's just we we uh, we have this tendency, as, and I'm sure it's not just in Buffalo. I only notice because I live here to attribute the value to a guy like Zach Bogosian because of what we gave up to get him. Yep. We attribute it because we got back Evander Kane, and people didn't like Evander Kane. We got rid of Tyler Myers and Joel, Joel Armia, Armia, who now yeah. got banished to the other side of Canada, to Montreal. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to see Joel Armia score on the Sabres five times a year. <laughs> just like uh, who was it last year? Brian Flynn. Yeah, Flynn. Tim Schaller. All those bit players who leave Buffalo and mm-hmm. then resurrect their careers. Uh, it's not a huge fan of the trade. But there's an influx of new bodies, an influx of new blood, sure. more so than just, you know, just the give typical offseason. Give, give me a skilled fast winner that you can put on. Do you guys from Jack Eichel? You are, I think you already mentioned them I'm earlier happy. in the show. Who? Bailey that Baptiste maybe. and CJ Smith. And that's what I said, too, that maybe one of those guys slots in in the top six mm-hmm. role and provides the speed. We saw flashes of those guys playing in the top six. I mean, on that and off line last at, the end of la- at the end of last year, uh, Rodriguez, Bailey, and Baptiste, how good yeah. they played together. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, that was fun to watch. I still maybe like, e- Maybe Erod on Eichel's wing, too. I'm still a proponent for Middlestat on Jack's wing, and I know that's not a popular take, but I would love Jack, Sam, and Middlestat. I don't know if he can do that now with your lack of top center depth. Right. Getting rid of O'Reilly slapped mm-hmm. Middlestat in very firmly at center to me. Right now, I got Sabaka as my like my seventh forward. Yeah, or not thirteenth. Thirteenth forward. forward. Yeah. Yeah. So you got who? You got Jack with Sam and Shiri. Yeah, and we'll set with Palmer and, and Opozo. Yeah, and then Berglund with Gergensen's. Berglund, Thompson? Baptiste, and Bailey. Do you have Thompson in your top twelve, or is Thompson? I got Berglund with Rodriguez and Bailey. Okay. Is Thompson in your top 12? And I got Larson with Gergensons and Wilson. So Thompson's in the AHL for you. Yeah. And Baptiste, too. Mm. And Baptiste to start, yeah. And we talked about Asplund. Do you think he's going to be in the AHL? Probably. I think to start. I think all of the European guys are be down there for at least a year to learn yeah. smaller ice. It's, it's Botterill's mindset as he wants to he's develop these guys slow, as a cohesive patient, group. developmental guy. Yeah. Which I, I like. I think Get them down, playing together yeah. and one team, learning the North American game together. And you'll see those maybe it was Olafson and Asplund maybe a both pilot of them. right yeah all the Swedes there's we, so many Rasmus we talked guy. about the uh, the cap next year too I mean we're trying to find a valid figure of how much cap space the Sabers have we've seen it's anything pretty good amount from though. sixteen to twenty six million which is pretty good and then next year thirteen more million would be coming off in Bulio in Pominville and in Larson what does Bubble come off. What's that? Get Bogo off there. When's he come One off? Next year. So they have $5 million this year and next for Bogo. Um, it's a long contract. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Way to go, Winnipeg. But, uh, but it, Bogo it, doesn't it, come off after this year. Pominville, uh, Bolio, and, and who else did I just say? Gergensen's come off after this there's year. There's almost got to be another move coming because there's so mm-hmm. many players that – like. I got like I got Sabaka right now is thirteen. They got to be moving and so many defensemen. There. And you and you you know they got to want to have CJ Smith get a chance this year. And you're still yeah. Bailey. I think they Scott could Wilson. Yeah. Scott Wilson was good, not great, but he was good last year. Yeah, he I mean, might play. He's him. a decent bottom six yeah. winger. He can and score though. I so mean, you got all those extra forwards. Yeah, he didn't that you score a nice time. Then you got all the extra D men now that. Yep. There's a guy, and, and the three first episodes, there's got to be something else. I could see them coming. packaging one of their extra forwards or one of their extra defensemen for a pick or a prospect yep. or something. 
Get rid of the problem with all this team is so worthless. Just get them out of here. Uh, my Facebook memory <laughs> showed up, and I said, everyone's excited that Pominville's back, and I'm more excited for Scandella. He played good uh, the first five games, and he was unnoticeable. He only played season. well and with everyone, Jack, and that was the problem. People only remember that goal he scored in the first game. Against and Montreal. Everyone remembers that and that was Jack's pass more Jason. than his. That yeah. was a 38-foot pass on a dot. Mm-hmm. And, but no one, no one on this team played well without Jack. Mm-hmm. Oposo's production came with Jack. Reinhardt's production, that's a lie. Reinhardt produced without Jack for those 50 mm-hmm. games that he had. But for the most part, like like Housley would break up Jack and Evander in an effort to spark another line, and instead none of the lines worked. So he'd have to put Evander back with Jack, and that was... You look at this lineup, too. There's like a, a serious lack of toughness, in my opinion. Yeah. It's not that... I don't know. Who's out there that's going to defend... Eichel, some of the scumbags, them or middle stat, some of their scumbags, and they're all a bunch of, I don't know. Maybe Scandella. He's not afraid to. I think the defenders will. Risto mm-hmm. kind of showed that side of himself yeah. last yeah. year a little bit. But you want Risto hurt and break his hand in a Risto fight. looks jacked, too. He does. <laughs> he's he's real he looks jacked, like he's baby. been lifting. Getting that off-season frustration now. Yep. I don't know. It, know. It, I would rather not worry about that part of the lineup and just hope that some, I mean, you can find guys who are big and can hit. I'm not really worried about it. It just yeah. I just looked at it and I was like, Larson can do it. Well, on the other side, if you want small, <laughs> if you want fast, you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of that tenacity. I just need a fast. Like who? Who does Tampa have? That's the guy. tough guy for them. And you got, huh? Who does Tampa have? That's a tough guy for them. Steve Stamkos is tough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Like, if you're skilled enough, do you really need Ryan toughness? I know. I get it. Uh, trust me, I get it. But it feels like if you're good enough, you know. They don't need to be tough because if you piss him off, Kucherov will just score five times on Tom you. Tom Wilson. <laughs> That's the Capitals, but I he's great. Tom Wilson. Tom Wilson's phenomenal. People that don't realize how much Tom Wilson played top line minutes this year when there was injury, he played he top played line lot. with Ovechkin and Kuznetsov and was fantastic. But anyways, digress. Just not, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not a fan of the current state of this team. Well, I could have said that any time the last three years. Correct. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, like the future is looking pretty okay. But like, I just want them to be watchable next year. And right now, I don't think, I don't know. Not, you'll, you'll be able to get your five-minute online highlights of the things that Jack and Darlene did. Yeah. And well, hopefully this, somewhere in there will be scattered a few good watchable If Jack games. goes down again, oh, man. This team's, yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even watch the Sabres after Jack went down. You couldn't. Yeah, there was, was nothing miserable. going on when Jack wasn't playing. Yep. <laughs> they couldn't even break the puck out of their they own end. Like prepared. on the power play, no one wants the puck on their stick. They all drop it back to Jack, and he passes it up between the blue line and the, the red line, and they drop it back to him like, no, 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 you please take it. And I'm hoping Darlene changes that a little bit. I'm hoping that. Darlene should be super fun to watch. I forget. Yeah. I keep forgetting Darlene's in the team now. He still hasn't hit me yet. And what are your guys' thoughts on Carter Hutton? Not trying to change the – I wanted Hutton as soon as it was announced that he was a UFA. It sounds like he took less money. His agent yeah. said he left he left money on the table. Well, it's a much better opportunity here for him. Yeah, he left money on the table. And speaking of leaving money on the table, John Tavares gave up fourteen million dollars to you know two million dollars for seven years. Fourteen million dollars he gave up to play for Toronto over San Jose. Yeah. But anyways, Carter Hutton gives up money to come here because he wants a chance. He sat behind Pekka Rene. He sat behind Jake Allen. And I heard a Blues reporter say today that that there were nights that Hutton probably should have been given the goal. But because St. Louis had invested in Jake Allen and kind of named him the starter, and Hutton understood that, and Hutton was good with it. But there were nights he said that, I mean, Hutton went 17-7 and seven last year with, a, what, nine three one save percentage, something really good. Like, Hutton wanted a chance to be a starter, and I think with, with Hutton and Allmark, instead of 1-2, and two, it's going to be 1-A and 1-B. Hutton might be 1A with the NHL experience, and Allmark might be 1B. It might end up being split starts like you had with Ryan Miller and John Gibson and you know, not a situation where you have a, a true starter on, on day one. But I like the acquisition of Carter Hutton, and I think last year was an anomaly for him. He He's played in the, year, the league a long time, and last year was his best year by a lot. But for $2.75 million, they took a flyer on him, and I think that's a – I'm excited. I think that he's going to be pretty good. Yeah, they got a re- really good deal for him. But was it last year's? But last year's his best year, two point oh nine goals against average, yeah, nine thirty one. That's my percent. thing with Hutton. Like he's had one really good year. He's on the plus side of thirty, but, and yeah. he, he could turn out to be a Tim Thomas right. who just he started developed at thirty three late. I'm not going to hold my breath and expect that Carter Hutton's going to revolutionize goaltending. If anything, you hope he eats up some games until Linus Olmark is firmly your number so, one. So here's a hot take I, I dropped earlier on somebody. I, I'm, I'm not a. I'm a, I'm a fan of this signing. I don't hate it. 
but they signed a 32 year old career backup in place of a 26 year old goalie who hasn't had a ceiling yet. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the only thing. That's yeah. only criticism. And yeah, Leonard was an RFA too. You expect too. Carter Hutton yeah. and Scott Wedgwood to be better than Leonard if they're getting the same shots but, at them. You're going to be disappointed. But I think this. I think letting go of Leonard was more of. Putting faith. I think it needed to happen. Yeah, culturally I think, again. I think I think I don't think it's a cultural thing. I think I think, I think letting go Leonard was more of a decision on Allmark than it was. Sure. Hutton. Yeah. You know what I mean? Can we can we say too? And not, the reason that it doesn't matter is because he was the backup goalie and he's a UFA. But Chad Johnson spit more fire than Ryan O'Reilly did. Chad Johnson, they you know they asked him if he would sign here again, and he's like, I know I didn't have a great year. But it's really hard to win on this team. Yeah, he's yeah. like, this team is awful. Like he he stopped short of that, but he essentially you, you what he meant, ripped though. his teammates and said, right, rightfully so. The dude's hung out to dry, and that's just how it is. But what he said was severely more egregious than what Ryan O'Reilly said, I and a, he wasn't wrong. I had a fiery post about Chad Johnson dialed up the Twitter, but I didn't post it. If I got to hear, his, if I go back and listen to his comments, I get mad again. It'll come back. I guess I'll do that later on do the it, show. Probably do it. I want to hear it. <laughs> It was basically making excuses. Like, your job is to bail out the team, and you couldn't do it. I don't know. I I don't know. Ha- something along those lines. I mean, it is to an extent. I don't know. Maybe I just view goaltending I differently. I gotta hear it again. Like, the times out of having to bail out a team, like, you hope your goalie does it, but I never expect my goaltender to make up for the other five guys on the ice not making their assignments correctly. There's going to be times in the game where the goaltender has to do something because mm. the other team made a better move. I'd say but there's... Leonard and Johnson and Olmark, when he played, were just completely left out on an island. Yeah. Yeah. You said there's times in a game. I think there should be times in a season, like maybe two or three games a year, your goalie's got to steal you one. Yeah. But the other 75, you'd like your team to look competent in front of them. And Allmark's first start, didn't he face like 53 shots? Yeah. And he he won. He he did. Stopped like 52 of them. I was that game. It was great. I mean, yeah, it's just like a shooting gallery out there. And, you know, the number of times that Leonard would get beat back door, you know, because the Sabres defenseman has lost lost track of people the are watching the pucks. They're not taking their man yeah. in front of the net. And how? I mean, I don't want to. We don't have a count for it, but how many goals that were scored on him? And this is not to excuse him not wanting to do shootouts or not being good at them or <laughs> any other attitude problems that he had with the team. But a lot of goals, any goalie gets those goals scored yep. on him. Yep. I don't care who you have. And goaltending is such. It's like pitching too in baseball. Like goaltending is such a mental thing for yeah. these guys. We talk. We also talk about how weird goalies are and how ritualistic and in their own heads they can be. And if you just get every game, you think that there's no one on the ice that's watching out for you. I would have liked Chad to be a little bit more, you know, all for the team. But I can get where he's coming from. I watched that defense try to defend him, and they weren't really helping him out. That doesn't make him a good goaltender. He's a very average backup goaltender, in my opinion. But yeah, he's not completely baseless. No, and I don't. I don't. I don't fault him for what he said it just to me was so much more egregious than what o'reilly said and people wanted to you know lynch o'reilly over it and he ultimately was maybe that's not the reason why you know and the people that are upset i did not want o'reilly traded but very similar to the evander kane sweepstakes you know they they traded him for next to nothing or what like if he he was not gonna sign in buffalo come july 1st period you had to trade him if o'reilly does not want to be in buffalo even though immediately after saying he lost his love for the game, Paul Hamilton asked him, do you, do you want a change of scenery? He says no. He vehemently denied it. No, I want to be part of the solution. You don't know what he said behind closed doors or to you know other teammates or whatever. So Even Botterill said yesterday that if he didn't get traded, he was going to be a big piece here. But that could just be GM speak also. And because he's been your third leading scorer the last two years. you know He's going to be a big piece when he puts up 60 points wherever he goes. Yeah. You know he he's earned that right to be a big piece wherever he goes because he's good. I don't know he did you know I, he did at least his, his certain leadership qualities the the the, the coveted probably not the right word but you know, Riley practices yes everyone always praised one off the ice and remember when his first year here he got all the credit for Reinhardt turning it around <laughs> um and helping him work on his shot and things like that remember that when it's his first year here. He's getting all yep. the credit for Reinhardt being a better player. Well, in one debate that can be laid to rest, it was always like, you know, who's going to be the captain? We know it's Eichel's team, but O'Reilly is kind of the cup-winning leader. Elder statesman. And now that's just out the window. Just put the C on his yeah, jersey was, and call was, it a day. I was talking with uh, Dave Ricci earlier, who writes the West New York Hockey Journal, and he, think, he, he wasn't a huge fan of the trade either, but he thinks this trade was more about finally making it Jack's team 
not having them toss up in competitions in the room between Jack and O'Reilly mm-hmm. of whose team it is and who's going to be the captain. And I think this year you're going to get that C on Eichel's jersey. Possibly a number change. Yeah. We're just going to leave that as it is. But uh, if it happens, we called it first. Don't buy a Jack Eichel jersey anytime time between wait now until, and training camp. Uh, <laughs> wait until there's a C on it at the very least. Yeah. I, I think, think those announcements will be synonymous. I mean, if you're going to do one, you would do them both together. And only competition he's got for captain would be Acaposa, but Jack's That's got not the even eight a competition year, to me. Jack's yep. got an eight-year, seven-year contract. That's not a competition to me. I know what you're saying, but it's to me, it's just not, yeah, not yeah. even close. It's a face your franchise for the next seven, eight years. It's Jack's team. It's Jack's team. Whether it works and or whether it doesn't, it's Jack's team. Jack called Darlene after he got drafted. The captains do that. You know what I mean? They had the picture on Twitter. Jack's I cool. love Darlene hanging out after he was picked and Wearing hanging out to meet jersey. the other draft picks, too, I love by the way. I just love him. Him and his mom went to a party, like a post-draft party on Friday night, and no one recognized him. <laughs> Nobody knew who he was. To be fair, because they all wear helmets yep. all the time. Hockey players are probably the least recognizable, other than their like, huge size in some cases. Like, you recognize John Scott. But, like, I think a lot of NHL players could just walk into a restaurant and sit down, and maybe the diehard know. fans would notice him. I'm a huge fanboy. I wouldn't notice any saber out in public. I, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever pictured uh, seen a Bill player, a Bills player out in public. You would notice them. Well, apparently Colton Schmidt goes to Mess K all the time, and no one knows who he is. Well, he's a, he's a huge right. He's a huge soccer fan, so he's always at Mess K. And just start asking everyone at Mess K next time I'm there if they're Colton Schmidt. <laughs> Who's walking you up, Colton? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, walking Colton. Colton. Duck. Look the other way. Like... <laughs> it's a hockey. How about Tavares? Yeah, what do you think? There was someone that legitimately called into GR and said the Sabres should have signed Tavares. They had all the cap space that they needed. Are you? He, he would have played. He played in Toronto, as I said. He gave up fourteen million dollars to play for his child. It was like the Chris Drury thing. He had the chance to sign in Buffalo for the same amount as mm-hmm. the Rangers, and he was from Trumbull, Connecticut. He grew up a Rangers fan. I think it's there's like going, more to the jury deal, though. Yes, a hundred percent. But given the choice, he chose his childhood team that he rooted for. I don't. Yeah, I get it. I mean, a couple million more to stay with the Islanders and get a year more with the Islanders. A couple million more to go play for the Sharks. His heart was just, he lives in Ontario during the off season. He grew up, as you mentioned, a Leafs fan, posted a picture of himself on Twitter after signing with all Leafs bed sheets and everything. His heart was in signing with Toronto. And I think as Sabres fans, we hope that that wasn't the case. We wanted to see him go to the West or stay with the Islanders. and It's tough. And it puts the Leafs in an interesting cap situation in a couple of years, but for now, that's going to be... They have some questions on defense. As I say, are you afraid of this team now? Because I'm afraid they're going to score five to six goals a yeah, game, but I'm but they're going to give them up the six, too. Six or seven. Freddie Anderson. I mean, he he was good. He played. He had a good year. But Freddie Anderson, Morgan Riley, um, Gardner, Jake Gardner, Zaitsev. Now you're starting to kind of scratch your head a little bit. Yeah, they're going to need some of those guys in the defense to step up or make another move, but. Matthews, Tavares, Marner, Nylander is disgusting. Nylander's yeah. going to get offer sheeted. That one's not going to happen. That's, yes, no, it's not. But yes, it is. I would like it to, but it's not going to happen. <sighs> I want to see those. I want to see offer sheets so much, so bad in this league. Other team, it's a cold war. No one, other no one teams, wants to do it. Other sports do it all the time. Flyers Mike Gillisley, Chris <laughs> Hogan, the Patriots have done it to the Bills a hundred times in the last three years alone, and that is not the reason for Bills fans' ire towards the Pats. It's far from it's it. It's such like, a different culture. It feels like NHL DMs don't want to be the one to fire the first shot. It's like waiting to start the Civil War. Like. If you if you're the team that does it and aggressively and the Shea Weber Philadelphia thing is hilarious because that contract would have been the worst thing that Mike Holmer ever did in a string. Of, we're talking off air about the, him trading JVR for Luke Shen one for one. one. For one. That Weber contract would have been a hundred times worse than that. He's called Fourteen Mike Holmgren. years. Um, but that those happen <laughs> so sporadically, and they're all established players. The first team that goes after a young player. After his like his entry level contract goes, a guy like a Marner, a Nylander, a Matthews, X Y Z guy like that, they're afraid like no one's going to trade with them, and no one does it because they don't want that to happen to their young players that they're training. I wonder if it's like a it's like a unwritten law slash rule slash old boys club thing to where like if you if you do this to another team's young player. That you'll be blacklisted by other GMs and no one will trade my, with you. I think it's 100% my thinking what is, is, but my thinking is like I I get it, but. It would be one thing if, like, the Leafs GM is butthurt by the Sabres offer sheeting Austin Matthews 
next year and offering them four first round picks, you know, because they offer him a $12 million deal right. and then the Leafs sign him to the, to the money and the Leafs GM say, that was a shitty thing to do. We're not going to deal with you anymore. Well, the Sabres and Leafs aren't going to trade with one another anyway. Like you have teams saying, um, they, they didn't want, um, the senators did not want Hoffman traded within their division. So he gets traded out West and then gets traded back into their division anyway. Like that, how is that any different than offer sheeting somebody? Why are you not mad at the Sharks for that? That they, they might be mad at the Sharks. For yeah, that. but but that is easily just as much of a faux pas as I didn't use the right word, the right term for faux pas. But it's just as easy as much. It's just as easily as much of screwing with somebody. You know, like I think all these GMs are scared of developing, finally having a good base of a team like Toronto is developing. And then being tight against the cap and having to really finagle and convince these players to take less money to all play together. So be it. And they're worried that some guy's going to come in and say, hey, Will, here's $9 million. And Toronto's like, I only have eight. I can't give him that. And But, then that, but and the that, compensation is so fair. Like it I is. Don't, I don't disagree For with nine you. Million I would, dollars, love, teams, have to I would give up. love teams that have money to be able to go at young right. players and bolster their teams. But On the other side... You want all the teams that are struggling to develop players to be able to actually turn out to be decent. You know what? Toronto you, was garbage you know what we're for forgetting on all of us. The player has to sign your deal. He does. the The Sabers could offer sheet Austin Matthews next year and offer him thirteen million dollars a year, and he could tell them to go pound salt. In which case, none of this happens. Like he, the 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 Leafs don't have to match it. it he, the Sabers don't have to pony up the draft picks if he come. He could just tell them to buzz off. So it's not like it's. It's not protected. If you have a good enough relationship with Austin Matthews, you tell him, "Look, we're going to be able to pay you eleven and a half million dollars, you know." And but you know, if you want to be here, if a team offers sheet you twelve million, don't sign it. You know, we want you here. We believe in you. I just don't understand this whole like a team like Arizona and Buffalo that are consistently bad. They tend to have salary cap space. If you want more parity in the league, you need to renegotiate this in the CBA. I that. Don't- Teams that are not good that have a lot of cap space can become competitive by I, offer sheeting RFAs. I think it's a thing that, like, if you do it to some team, just I think uh, it's, a, it's like a general rule across the board that other teams will just stop working with you. They don't want it to be a thing. I just, I think, I think that's kind of like a, yeah. a situation it is. Did it happen? You know to, I mean, did it happen to Edmonton when they offer sheeted Vanek? I mean, I don't even know. Did like teams not want to talk to Edmonton? Vanek was not like young, but he was not. It was young. A it was his first. He was contract. a young developing. It was his first player. contract out of his yeah. ELC. Yeah. Yeah. So that's he, and he that's the, that. the only recent one that comes to mind as far as like a well, Ryan O'Reilly level. was offer sheeted by the Flames when he was with Colorado. Mm-hmm. Classic Calgary throwing their money around signing James Neal no, offer sheeting O'Reilly. I just, I, you, and you feel like one of these young GMs are coming in would be the one to do it. Like, I mean, ship child. What is do it? What is your job? Jacob. Your job is to make your team as good as possible. Yeah, and pull out all the stops to do it. Even I think Dubas, Dubas in Toronto. I think if he has Kessler's, I think you start seeing him do it in the next few years because good these young guys are going to be the ones that do it, not good. the old boys. I think we'll get to it eventually. I don't think someone's like we're going to go to a year where a couple of different GMs just agree to do it together. And if they start flying around and everyone starts to do it, then it's a mutual disadvantage, and, and everyone just yeah, has everyone to deal hates with it. everyone. And the Leafs are so kind of strapped for cash right now, and pretty close against the the the, the cap. Matthews and Marner next year. I would love to see the Sabres just force their hand. Yeah. The the and rumors the, were the Islanders were going to retaliatory, retaliatory retaliate by offer sheeting Nylander. That'd be great. However, <laughs> they don't have the draft picks to do so. Yeah, you have to have your so you have they, to own your own yeah, picks. So the the range you would look at is like eight to nine mil which is like a f- two first and a second or something. It's a lot. But they don't have the second to do it. And so you, they would have to offer over 10 where it becomes four firsts. Because you have, you have, you have, to, have to have your own, own picks to do it. I, I would love to see it. It should be like an aggressive ballsy move. Like you're going to sign Tavares and avoid your defense like that. Strap them, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. to just be all offense and no defense. Yeah. Because that's the only way we're going to beat them for the next, you know, five, six years. I mean, the Sabres have three first-round picks next year, right? Yeah. Okay. There's one of the four for Marner. Right. Yeah. They they can't they can't do Nylander for, like, the mid-range because they don't have a second-round pick next year or something. That sounds right. So they wouldn't be able to do two firsts, a second, and a third, which is, like, the five, six to $8 million range or so. I don't know. Um, it, it would just be a lot more interesting. It would make ref- restricted free agency a lot more meaningful yep. yeah. instead of just, well, your contract's up, but 
you're coming back here. We both know it. Yeah. Barring some sort of crazy circumstance. Right now, the cr- the the crazy thing that happens with RFAs is when they're not tendered, like Leonard. Yeah. That's the big. Or they go news. to arbitration and get Correct. awarded way more than Correct. the team wants. But even then, that's just what's open and shut. You're back here anyway. Correct. Yeah. Let's make restricted free agency a lot more fun. I mean, there's so much time in the offseason to kill and talk about stuff. A couple of young players trading teams big time, making big money, becoming key point pieces. I, and, I hope it happens. And if point. it was out there, you would immediately be seeing who has four first round picks. You know what I mean? Like the Sharks are out. They can't do it because they don't have their 2019 pick. The Blues are out. Yeah. But you know who's in? You know, the, the Coyotes have their four picks. And, and it's they... not like you can do this all the time either because if you're going crazy all in on a guy and offering the four first round picks... You can only do that once every four years Correct. by definition. And you're probably you have overpaying. Be, you have to make sure you pick the right guy. And you're also, you, you are overpaying. You're overpaying you're intentionally because overpaying. otherwise they'll just sign him and match the deal like what right. happened with Vanek. So if, if, if you get your guy, you better hope it's the right guy. Because if you go out tomorrow and you offer shoot William Nylander and give up four first-round picks, doesn't matter if it worked or not, you're out. Yes. Toronto gets him for four year, your picks for four years. It doesn't matter. That's why... The revisionist history of the Vanek thing is so interesting because you think of what the Sabres would have been without, what Edmonton would have been with. Yep. It's interesting. Yep. I, th- I think it'll be Cheka or Dubas or one of the new blood GMs who does it first. Arizona has a ton of money. The, all money. All the money. Who else were they talking about having issues getting to the floor? Like the Islanders are going to have an issue getting to the cap floor. Well, that's why they had to pay Valtteri Filpula. Yep. Who is terrible. Awful. It's going to be another Sabre trade soon. The next month is going to be a trade. Yeah, I think it's yeah. going to be a less exciting they one. They have but... to. They can't keep nine NHL defensemen. They also got They're... a plethora of, wing, of of forwards now, too. Yeah. They got to get out some of these old guys and get some room for the young guys. I would not be surprised if they tried to move Bogosian's contract and just, just didn't get a lot who's back. Who's going to take it? Someone who needs defensive help just if take, he's healthy. Pay half of it. Yeah. You, you can sit yeah, on you half, can the money. half the money. Someone's like, oh, Another thing about the rather do they save seven half million dollars? Okay, that's yeah. They cool. just gave it all that's, back to Berglund and Sabaka. That, that's though. cool in the Galisano era, but like, <laughs> what a... calm down. I think Regis. they had seven point three come back, three and a half and three point eight. I, that might be wrong. Yeah, Berglund's I mean, three point five. I, and... I don't know. Maybe maybe Berglund or Sabaka turns into a decent top nine player. I mean, they're kind of buried down in St. Louis beneath the Tarasenko's of the world. I mean, they're not going to get top three minutes, right. but I don't know. Maybe yeah, maybe Berglund turns into a decent role player. I'd. Not completely lost on him. I did love that Shiri trade, though. I yeah, they gave up basically nothing. 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 Yeah. And they have an extra if it, third. If, yeah, and if, it does, if the Shiri trade doesn't work, oh, well, it doesn't work. They gave up nothing. And he's only $3 million for two years. And you bring in Matt Hunwick, which just means you have more depth to get rid of a defenseman in the near future. Yep. Yeah, that might be 10 defensemen with Hunwick. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. If we were to sit here and name off all the defensemen, if you include Pilot, I think they're at 10. We got your top six we talked about, then Falk, Hunwick, Pilot, and Julio is not in the top Julio, six. Yeah, McCabe, we did not put in the top six. We did not put McCabe in the top six. Your lefties were Gooley, R- Darlene, and um, Scandella. Isn't that nuts? That, now we're talking defense. 10 or 11. This is crazy. Package them up. Who do you want? Something's got to go. Something's got to go. And we I can, don't we, want it to I be I could use a top six winger. I hope it's not Risto. Yeah. Well, I think... Risto is expendable at this point. On, in my he's opinion. got value. That's because yeah. he's got three years left. The, at that's part of why of O'Reilly year. was the guy who left too, because he had actual value. Yeah, it's cool that you, you're going to trade. If, if there's a trade in the back end, you're probably going to see. I think Risto or McCabe. Risto brings you value. I wouldn't mind McCabe. McCabe was just kind of like a, a meh. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not. But great. he's young. Yeah, but so teams just, teams will look at him and say, "Well, he's young. He can still develop." He's just a guy. Bullio too. Bullio's a two point four million. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's got a lot of value. Don't get me wrong, but. He's an expendable piece, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be a hate if I saw Risto go, but because you'd probably get a solid return, and I think they can live without him at this point with the way their defense. Yeah, works. if they trade Risto, it better be for bona fide top winner. He's a, he's a good player. I'm not. I'm not saying I don't like no. him. Get rid of him. He's a good player, but it's, he's a good player. I don't think he's a great. I think he, he plays great every fourth game. And he can barely make a breakup pass to save his life with someone's t- tape. I just want to keep him because if you look like the Predators who are competitive every year, it's because they have four defensemen that are all top pair guys. P.K. Subban plays their third defensive pair mm-hmm. very often <laughs> because they're that loaded at defense. Yeah. And it just feels like that might be a bit of a mistake to trade away a I mean, top-tier defenseman. How's he's got to be pumped looking at that D, I that, know. that D lineup? 
But then he goes look at the be a dream for him having again. Darlene coming in. Oh my gosh, you know. This like, could save his job. This could Darlene. save him and Botterill's job. Darlene literally just saved it's like changed the entire face. I don't think Botterill's job is a No, but we thought Eichel saved Tim Murray's job and boy were we wrong because that wasn't true, but I, I just think Botterill's going about it I think the right way. I actually was thinking about this earlier now they brought it up. If he comes in and because I think this team is not is, is worse than last year right now with losing Riley on paper Riley. probably yeah mm-hmm. it depends on how much Darlene can bring to the table for real it and depends then, yeah Darlene's a big also, piece of that you're also missing Kane who was a big part of the team last year and you're the only real big addition you're gonna have right now is middle stat and how much can he bring he's he's still very young very very young uh, developing player but like if anyway back to the whole bottle thing. What if he does finish last place two years in a row and no improvement? And with Housley, uh, Bilesma and Tim Murray were both out in two years. Mm-hmm. Why is the difference for Housley and, well, and Botterill? What would be different, in my opinion, is Botterill didn't drain the pipeline. He refilled it mm-hmm. with prospects. Murray traded away the pipeline to be good now, and it didn't work. Botterill just traded O'Reilly for two draft picks and a prospect. You know, like... Botterill didn't drain the pipeline in order to get good. He did the opposite. You look at the the minor league deals, even like stupid things like trading for or signing Nathan Page and stuff like that, like just trying to make Rochester good. Um, they it, We talk about them having 9 to 10 potential NHL defensemen. Well, that means that Rochester's defense is going to be very good. Um, these guys that are on two-way deals will be down there. Um, you know, Botterill is setting this team up for success in the future, and I think that's going to be more what – because with Murray, when O'Reilly, Eichel weren't enough, who did he have to try with? You know, he didn't have anybody sitting behind him. If, if you know, these guys don't work out, you have Cliff Poo and Rasmus Asplund and, you know, Pilot and Olafson and, and Samuelson, right? Matias Samuelson, another, you know, the 32nd pick last year. He seems to be filling the pipeline with prospects. I think that's what's different. I love how many podcasts in a row we can go without even acknowledging that Alex Nylander still plays hockey. I know. Well, the Sabres he's, he's, didn't even acknowledge it. He didn't participate in <laughs> development camp. He had a little injury. He said any, they said anybody with an injury wasn't going to skate. But apparently when they were asked if he was hurt, they said he was fine. That's not what I heard. I had Paul Hamilton this afternoon talking about why Nylander didn't play in development camp. And when they asked if he was hurt, the team was mum on it. Mm-hmm. I saw him on the ice for the rehab skate Friday yeah. morning. Because I went cause usually I skate every Friday morning at Northtown Center. And we did it this past Friday. But I didn't get that memo. So I showed up, and there was a rehab skate on the ice we skate on, and Nylander was out there skating. So you skated with Alex Nylander? I didn't skate with him. I saw him on the you ice. Ska- Justin skated with Alex Nylander on nah, Friday morning. Proud That's what I heard. Making strides, man. Literally. Good pun. <laughs> I'm good for one of show. But you know, all the all the AHL, all the Amherst fans say that he was probably their eighth and best forward last yeah. year. Yeah. But when he came up for it's those, a long th- development. When he came up for those games at the end of the season, he looked good. He looked okay. He yeah. didn't look bad. He could be one of those he guys had, like... He had opportunities and he made plays. He could be one of those guys like Rodriguez who just thrives on the speed of the big league game. Rodriguez, Rodriguez came up here... hated Rochester. Rodriguez came up here and said that he thought the AHL was easier for him, but better for... Not, he said like those terms easier because you get more space. In the AHL, it's more tight. He said in the NHL, there's more space because everyone's so fast. Hmm. But he, he, I don't know, maybe that it is a thing. I don't think he's quite a lost cause yet. No, he's not. No. Yet. He's, he's 21 he's, years yeah. old. Like, you know. Well, everyone looks at his brother who right. came up into, into the league and lit it on fire. Well, his brother was supposed to be the blue chip prospect of the two. But everyone develops differently. Yep. Yeah. And I, the Duke can so rip young. the puck. He rips it. And what's so bad about his game? I don't know. And ho- you can play hockey till you're 40. He was in the. Cor- he I could have him- 20 years left. Right. I saw him in corner going at the pucks. I saw him back checking when he was up here with the Sabers. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he doesn't feel the AHL's important. Maybe he doesn't get it. Which is the wrong yeah, attitude. Maybe he's but- just learning it. I mean, the, it, until last year, the AHL wasn't important for Buffalo. Right. Mm-hmm. Until Botterill came in, the AHL didn't mean jack shit to you're those right. guys down there. It didn't mean anything to the owners. It didn't mean anything to the GM. That's a great and they point. They certainly didn't build the team to be good down there. So, like, hey, Alex, go play with this team, a bunch of random guys we just didn't know else to do with. We call them up and send them down occasionally because we don't really want them here, but we also feel that you get to play. We just juggle the lines a bunch, and the team is terrible. If if he's if we're another year or two down the line and he just doesn't get Rochester and still isn't producing with Botter all around, I'll be concerned then. But it's yeah. it's it's a mindset from the top down, and Botterill has made it clear that Rochester matters, and being in Rochester should start mattering to the people that are there. I thought he looked good when he was up here, and I think he should get another shot. 
And he, he looked great with like Posa. He was playing with like Posa a lot, and he was setting him up, and vice versa. He had a goal that was up here, right? It was a weird yeah, thing. Yeah, so. he was flying through the air, and the puck hit him on the way through. Was that what it was? Yeah, he like the puck hit his stick between the hash marks of the face-off circles, but he was airborne. like He was getting cross-checked, but he got a stick on the puck on the way through and deflected it in. I don't know. The thing is, he has he has speed, he has skill, and the Sabres lack speed and skill. I'm excited for Middlestat. I, you, it just flashed me back because I think in the same game that Nylander scored, Middlestat did, yeah. and it was the goal when we all knew. It was on the power play, and all of Buffalo, including, like, I physically said out loud with my wife sitting next to me, shoot it, Casey, and he did, and he roofed it. You remember that goal? Yeah, we heard the story 17 times, Yes, Steve. I know, and it was so <laughs> first exciting. Time on the podcast, though. And now no, I'm really the excited podcast. about it. Second time on the podcast. Yes, At least the third time Fifth on the podcast. Fifth or sixth time on the podcast. Well, Someone's giving shit. <laughs> every, I was sitting on the couch next to my wife, and I Seven. said, said shoot, shoot it, it, Casey, <laughs> and he did, and he scored, wait, and wait. it was awesome. What would you say? I said, Shoot it, Casey. I used his we, first can, name. Can we clip that? I got, I got chills a tenth time. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Nice round numbers. Do it for you. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that a lot more now. I'm just going <laughs> to... You know how you guys are doing Vessi Watch? I'm going to do Shoot it, shoot Casey. Shoot it, Casey. Yeah. I got to bring back Vessi Watch. He's an RFA. He's, he's an RFA. And, hey, what if Casey Middlestead ends up being like 75% Dude, as good as we hope he's going to be? The fact that... Uh, That's pretty damn good. That'd be pretty right? cool. Right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Thank the Lord that he could not... <laughs> Do pull up because the fact that <laughs> we do a pull up, he fell to eight. Before the we fact that we got him at eight, and you see him on the ice, oh. he should have been a top three pick. If he was drafted the next year, he goes number one. Where does Casey playing in the World Juniors rank in your favorite hockey memories from he, last Sabre season? In the development camp, number it, one. It, it, granted, it was three on three. That's a lot. He came he came across center ice. He literally he he, he was on the on the right wing, cut across the ice, got the blue line on the left side of the ice, cut back across to the right. And the whole, and he just kind of swooped back in, and the whole D, all three players just drop back. I'm like, what's he gonna do? And he just put a put on a show of his hands and made a play, and man was scored. Looked like Pekar got he into just, his head a little bit. Just yeah. backed off the defense so easily, and he responded and, exactly the way he wanted to. And you just you nail it. Like those moves he was making right after he took that hit, he's like, all right, you want to go at me? And then instead of being like trying to go at him physically or like retreating because he's a smaller kid. You can see the switch. You can see that light bulb go off in Casey's head. He's like, all right, kid, let's go for it. Yeah. And just turned on the Jets and just burned the defense. You want the, the puck, the take it, and they couldn't. He looked Kinda amazing. Made, you don't want to poke the bear. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you talk about with a guy. You, you mentioned it with Kucherov. Like, you don't want to go at Kucherov and get under Kucherov's skin because then Kucherov's going to be like, all right, let's go. Yeah. And he'll light you up for three or four. That's exactly what Casey did this yep. weekend. Yep. That's the scorer's mindset that we are desperately lacking yep. amongst our, especially anyone, basically anyone who's not Jack Eichel in Buffalo right yep. now. Yeah, if Middlestat shows the ability to carry a second line and all of a sudden you get two lines worth of, of scoring being carried by Eichel and Middlestat, this team will look significantly different, and I'm excited for it. And like I said, if, if Middlestat is half as good as we hope he'll be in his you know full rookie campaign, this team will look dynamically different because what if he scores 50 points? You know, what if he scores 60 points? Yeah, That's a, that's a different-looking team. Now let's say that... Jack establishes himself very well as our number one center, which I think we realistically expect that he will. Casey comes in and becomes a pretty decent second center. There's still a lot of questions on this team on the outsides, but if you get those two guys, Darlene and Risto, and some of your other other defenders established, what if Olmark comes in this year and proves to be a promising-looking starting goaltender? Now is next year, man, I don't know what they're going to do, or does next year turn into, man, if we just get a couple of wingers, maybe we're actually on the cusp of it. Sure. This could be the year, I think this year they're one year away. Yeah. Which no one no one wants to hear ever that your team is, over. Oh, just a year away. We're, we've been a year, the Bills were a year away for 20 years. Right. You never want to be a year away. But for the Sabres, who have been multiple years away at multiple points in the last couple of years, a team being a couple big signings away from knocking on the door sounds like a step up. And if Allmark is, if Allmark shows he can be a number one, you have a goaltender for 15 years or yeah. more, which is crazy. You know, you get him and Pekka Lukanen as your number yeah. one, number two for the future. Uka Pekka Where's he gonna play? <laughs> Where's he gonna play? Where's he gonna play? I don't play? know. Do you know? I don't know. Do you he, know? He Jeff, do you know? The man can play anywhere. He can play know. anywhere. Possibilities are endless. Endless. No one knows. Does he play in Canada? No one knows. Does he play in Europe? Does he play in Europe? <laughs> Does he play in the HL? Does he play He's in the not HL? limited to just one condom. The man could be anywhere. Does he play in the ECHL? Where's he going to play? Where's he going to play? I have no idea where he's going to play. Do you know where he's going to play? I have no idea. Where could he play? Steve, do you know? Uh, uh, you know what? I don't know. Who's on first? Know. What's on second? I don't know who's on third. <laughs> shoot it, Casey. Shoot it, Casey. I said, shoot it, Casey, and he did. 
they scored. Justin, while we're still on the hockey segment of this program, uh, when are you skating for the power play this year? Uh, it was the opening ceremony, the opening shift after the first two hours. And then I'm skating. I'm playing goalie at 2 to 6 p.m. That's exciting. Swiss cheese. I'm playing a six-hour oh. goalie shift. Possibly six eight-hour hour goalie. goalie shift. Possibly eight-hour goalie shift. Woo! My actual shift. I don't envy the smell of the locker room mm-hmm. afterwards. My actual goalie shift is 2 to 6, July 9th. But my friend's team, before that, the, very, the shift before that, he's worried about his goalie. And he asked me to play goalie today. I was like, I could do it. And I will do it if you need me to do it. So for those of you who are listening and are not familiar, this is the second year now that Justin is in, uh, participating in the 11-day power play, which is starting this Friday night down at Harbor Center. So if you are a local listener of the show, we would encourage you to go down to Harbor Center Friday night for the opening Thursday ceremonies. Night, right? Thursday, Thursday night? The 5th? Uh, no, it's Friday night. It's Friday like night. No. Oh, yeah. Today's the 2nd. It's Monday. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The third is Tuesday. Yeah. The fourth is Wednesday. Yeah. Uh-huh. The fifth is Thursday. Right. With you. It starts the fifth. I thought it was Friday. <laughs> you better fucking find it's out. It's Thursday. I'm, I'm coming to watch it. you skate Thursday night. You told me. It, see, this is me getting angry at Justin on the pot. <laughs> it's in my calendar, Justin. Okay, 7 p.m. I thought the Friday was, thought Friday was the All right, fifth. So Justin is so skating in the Thursday. opening ceremonies. <laughs> He's like, it's Friday. I'm like, the fifth Thursday. is Thursday. He's like, Justin's going to show up Friday night. Like, where is everybody? <laughs> I'm glad I knew that. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I, been I have it in my calendar because I'm going to come watch you. Been so Thursday night for the opening ceremonies where all the original guys are skating I'm mad from now. last year's 11 days. And then next Tuesday, from definitely from 2 to 6, possibly from 10 in the morning to 6, yeah. Justin is playing goalie. And I then, played and once. Er, and Eric's playing with you Tuesday, right? The 10th. The 10th. So Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. 10th, 2 to 6. You're, just so you know, they, they have all these teams now so that the same group of guys don't have to play all 11 days, but Justin's going to try anyway. Yeah, so <laughs> Justin doesn't have to sleep under the stairs and listen to all the bands above him. Yes. I get to go home after. Not lived there for 11 my days. Favorite, one of my favorite memories of the 11-day power play last year was going to record a podcast with you at it and you being asleep the entire time. I did not wake up. I did not wake I up. I did not wake believe up. believe that. We got your mom on the podcast, but we yes. did not get you on the podcast. She was there. I, I had to listen to that. I don't think I ever listened to it. It was decent. <laughs> we did okay. It, we, it was um, your best I, performance. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> That's Burned not far off. Got him. Roasted. Roasted. Burned. <laughs> destroyed. Wrecked, <laughs> R E K T wrecked. As wrecked all him. as all the youth would say, wrecked him. Damn near killed him. <laughs> oh, man. I played one. I played one seven hour shift as a skater, so I don't think eight hours of goalie is is doable. It's gonna feel. I, I would imagine it's gonna feel different this year though, because you guys aren't going we for subs. day after day we after day. Subs. Like, you who, don't have subs as a goal. Who else is uh, skating in the uh, inaugural names that we would know? Who's skating at the seven o'clock? First two hour shift. I don't know what you even know. I don't know. Well, Mike Lesikowski, who's him and his wife started the whole thing, are skating. Yeah. Lesikowski's skating, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 so it's uh, basically, Jeff, if you Jeff went Peters, last maybe? year, yeah, it's Andrew Peters' brother, Jeff Peters. Mm-hmm. Basically, if you went last year and watched the original guys, you will find them in the opening right. shift. That's why I was Thursday. asking for. I don't know. Like, they're really not Les names, Kuntar. though. They're all Les just. Les is a former NHL goalie. A couple of local radio guys, right? Uh, Jixter. Yeah. It's only one. Oh, yeah. And uh, Alan Davis, program director, GR. Oh, yeah. Alan, Alan's a fucking cool guy. Dude's a warrior. Yeah. No, no matter how many emails he sends us about having to switch over our radio app from TuneIn to Radio. He's even on the radio now. He's got that app. <laughs> I know. I, I heard that today for the first time. I was like, oh, I know that guy kind of through Justin, sort of. <laughs> Telling me to switch my app from TuneIn. I want to punch my iPad in the face every time it comes on. Everyone hates that stupid app. Yeah. Alan, everyone hates the app. Yeah, That's but you okay. Can't, you can't but show up in the Bulldog much. needs you to do something. Yes. Howard and Jeremy need you to do something. We need you to do something. Yeah, if you're bored, Thursday night. Do something. Thursday Thir- night. Are we sure? Yeah. <laughs> we have we confirmed? I'm going to be at the Harbor Center Thursday <laughs> by myself. Like, oh, Justin, where Steve's is everybody? Got, Steve's got the, I'm going to borrow the big cutout head we made you uh, of you for work last year. Please. I got it downstairs. I believe you. I, I thought the uh, fifth was Friday. So that's well, my thank, be. thank God that we told you this right now. And by we, I mean Steve. I, <laughs> I, was vehement, I was vehement about it. I'm like, damn it, it was Thursday. You told me. And then I'm like, the fifth is Thursday. And you're like, yeah. If you go for the opening hour, opening hour, they will have Dan Dunleavy and Rob Ray calling it live over the PA. So that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. 
It's pretty dope. Last year, I like that movie. Archie's on vacation, so you can't do it this year. Damn. I'll get you back for for next year. I was I was trying to get you and Eric on it, but it's okay. Dan I would have I would have been more than happy to, but I I'm okay with the fact that Dan un- outranks me a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. People know who he is. If I showed up there, I was like, "Who the fuck is this guy who's talking for an hour?" <laughs> the where voice they, of where FC did they Buffalo. Find this who? guy. <laughs> I, I I do uh I do UB men's hockey in the Buffalo Buttes. People will be like, oh, all right. "Who are those?" <laughs> and where is Dan Dunleavy? Most again? people say when I say that I was helping you guys out with the broadcast for UB men's hockey, they're like, "UB has a hockey team." I'm like, <laughs> "Yep, uh, there there it is." It's all right. It's the story of my life. Someday, someone will know who I am outside of the two of you. We love you, though. I appreciate it. I think you're well respected in the NWHL circles. Oh. I think, and and, that and, and, and and that's not to me as That does matter to me. Sure. And I appreciate that, and I like who we work with in the league. It's it, it is a different stratosphere, at least as it stands, though, from being Dan Dunleavy, or especially I mean, RJ is in a tier of all of his oh own, even on hockey broadcasts. RJ is. Somewhere else. I think, I think after Dunleavy, there's no one else that's probably better than you, in my opinion. Thank you. I appreciate it. I don't know if I try to blow you on the air or anything, but <laughs> I should delete that part. Right the not blow. to the podcast. <laughs> can't talk, about, can't talk 50. about blowing me on the podcast. <laughs> Our friends and family listen I to hear this. nothing. I want you to get an email from a... It's okay. <laughs> People can email me about blowing me anytime they want. Oh, We're leaving all this in now. This yeah, is absolutely. digressing very quickly. <laughs> No one's listening anymore. What? You you mentioned okay. I'll segue us. You mentioned doing play by play and FC Buffalo Friday. Jeff and I had the privilege of being at All High with Eric. Privilege is a word we'll use very uh, um, liberally here because Painful. yeah, that was a game that Buffalo had to have for the standings. So the way it looked is Buffalo came into the game behind uh, the Erie uh, Commodores by one point and. If they got beat by Erie, they would be four points behind them with only three points possible to get against the worst team in the division. And they needed a win to leapfrog and still would have needed help because yeah, Erie, Erie had, a game Erie had an hand. extra game in hand and Cleveland was... I think Erie was ahead of them. Cleveland and Fort Pitt were also ahead of them. Yes. And all those teams played each other. Correct. They so could've, they had to get points In theory, Buffalo could have leapfrogged them all as they bit each other right. on and the And it back. was top two that make the Correct. playoffs. So they basically needed to pass at least two of those three teams. Uh, unfortunately, and Steve kind of alluded to it, they did not come out strong in that game. Uh, dug themselves an early hole, allowed a couple goals in the first 20 minutes. I thought played a pretty decent 30 to 40 minutes mm-hmm. after that, um, but just couldn't generate offense. Got a couple of okay chances. Never got anything from it. Yeah, Bad turnovers for the third goal. Their three best chances, we, we talked about, their three best chances came off their heads. And that tells you that they didn't have time and space to work with in the attacking third because ideally you'd like to line it up and take a rip with your foot. And their three best scoring chances came off across to the box off of someone's head, which isn't a bad thing. But in general, that means you're not getting good looks. You know, it would be like if your best look in hockey was a backhand or like, you know, it was the best chance that I had to score was on the backhand. You'd ideally like to rip a clapper where you had all kinds of time and space between the hash marks to let it fly. But when you don't have as much time and space and you're in a tight window, you don't get as high quality chances. So although they controlled possession, they really didn't get a lot of good looks. And I know we talked about it during the game, the narrative of how much they miss you and Bald. Um, you had, you know, Matt Williamson and you and Bald center backs kind of shoring up the the back line for fc buffalo and without you and out on a yellow card accumulation they slot chris walter into the other center back role and both of their first two goals they get split down the middle and uh some some easy looks for erie they miss you and bald on the back end yeah. and credit to erie Erie was erie was a really good well put together team yeah. but they just yeah they got caught early erie knew where to attack them and they just never recovered yeah it was like their their mindset was altered by having to play from behind the whole game, and they never were able to get back into the game. And Erie's in a great position now. I mean, they're all but in for the playoffs, uh, depending on how they do this week. I think it is possible for them to get caught by Fort Pitt and Cleveland. Although it would, I think they would be have have to lose both games yes. outright. Is that who they play? Yeah, they play they play the second and third place teams now in their upcoming matches. But looks like Cleveland and. Cleveland and Erie control their own destinies here. Mm-hmm. Buffalo gets to go to Binghamton next week and try to end the season on a high note in the league. They do come back for a home friendly um, Tuesday, on the 10th. Tuesday, uh, July 10th. North Mississauga. 
It was the game that was supposed to be back in April, uh, but it got snowed out. We went from snowed out to 90 degrees for the last home league match on Sunday. On, on Sunday. Yesterday was Sunday. Friday. 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 I was confused because Justin and I had to travel to Ohio for two days last week. Oh, Threw off my entire week. So sick of going to Ohio. But overall, the the four nil scoreline felt right. You know, it it felt like Erie was just a much better team in general, and that they played much better than Buffalo. They did. And walking out of the stadium, it was like that game shouldn't have been anything but four nil. I mean, Buffalo didn't deserve to score, and they certainly didn't. They certainly deserved to give a couple up. So, uh, disappointing result for them. I know Nick Mandola, the owner, is very upset because he wanted the playoffs for the supporters and for himself and for the team. Um, you know, some good things to take away, but it feels like consolation at this point or an attempt at consolation, and they, you know, they're already going to be itching to get back at it next year because they probably feel like they should be one of these playoff teams this year. I think they have a good foundation for a team. I like co- the coach a lot. I think he's a very, very good soccer mm-hmm. mind in Frank Butcher. And they have a lot of young players if they can bring some of them, at least some of them back next year. I know it's a little bit harder at this level to mm-hmm. consistently build the same group year to year, but guys like Winkle, Shackelford, Wilson, McIver, mm-hmm. then Bald and Williamson on the back, there's certainly pieces to work with if they can bring that group back. Yep. And maybe another year of experience together. And we talked about those two games, one that was a loss with a lead in established time and one that was a draw. That's five points, and those five points of the difference on the season was how they played from the 90th minute on in those two games against tough competition against Erie and Cleveland. So maybe a little more seasoning, and you hope got, your guys are a little bit more tough in the 91st minute as they were in the you know the second or third minute. I think worth noting, we thank FC Buffalo, we thank Nick Mandola, we thank Franco's Pizza, Western New York Media Network, just giving all the plugs to the folks that brought us on this year it was oh, a great yeah. no, opportunity was, to work with it was great to be them. back i missed it last year when we didn't get through the broadcast um and it's good to be back and looking forward to more chances and maybe next year we'll get to be back for a, a more successful curtain call for the home side mm-hmm. um for their final home game but no it was definitely great to be back out there again this year with them any other uh things you guys want to touch about before we put a little bow on yeah. on this show anything else the exciting NLL, happened for you guys right, this the week nll's uh Protected players list were submitted at noon today. They should be released tomorrow morning. So uh, when is the expansion draft? July sixteenth is this. That might quick, not be eh? correct, but that rings a bell. So in in, in the next couple of weeks correct. at least. And you have the seals traded draft picks for Kyle Buchanan. So the seals have their first player um, from New England, their leading scorer last year, which is pertinent. You have the leading scorer from New England moving to San Diego. So San Diego will pick first in the. Entry draft, meaning the Wings will pick first in the expansion draft, but we'll see once these protected player lists come out how that shakes out. Obviously, that's exciting for me working for the NLL. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, especially from a local side, who the Bandits are protecting because they're getting to a point now where they have a pretty decent depth, especially at forward. Yeah, you can protect five forwards, five transition D-man, and one goaltender. My guess, Bouquet, protected. Mm -hmm. My other guess, Sean Evans, um, Dane Smith, Jordan Durston. Mitch Jones, Josh Byrne, five protected forwards. Defensively, Steve Priolo, Nick Weiss, Kevin Brunell, Mitch DeSnew, and pick whoever you want for the fifth guy. Because now you're looking at Ryan Wagner, you're looking at um, Ethan Schott, you're looking at... I kind of liked Wagner last Unless it's Stainhouse. I mean, do you protect Stainhouse? I don't know, but that would be where he would go. So At that, this point, I would feel like maybe you wouldn't. Yeah. Not because of... Yeah, but yeah, that's what I mean. History, so those four... Priolo, Weiss, Brownell, and DeSnew feel like the four you want to protect. Yeah. And the fifth one, I think you just pick one. I mean, Is it required for them to protect Keto Hill? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's and a good I would point. probably do Keto Hill if over. He's, yeah, that's if, a great If you point. have even an inkling he's going to be back next year, I would probably protect Keto Hill in that fifth yeah, spot. Then, the team still owns a, the team. The way that it's designated is he's treated as if he's a restricted free agent, even though he's not officially Mm -hmm. that the bandits would own his rights at least they did maybe they don't anymore when the league year expired but if any team offered him a contract the bandits could match it and he'd have to stay with buffalo that was the situation going if if memory serves he did this once prior in his career taking a year year. off yep when he was in rochester just took a year off and so we'll see if he comes back next year a nice piece if they can bring him back into the fold next year Uh someone who's that creative and good at turning defense into offense led the team in forced turnovers the year before the first year the league started um recording forced and unforced unforced turnovers and keto led the bandits in forced turnovers it's a pretty good stat to lead if you ask me i've always said to my buddy i've seen tickets with i was like i would absolutely hate keto hill if he played for any other team yeah. in the league he's the he's just that guy he gets under the everyone's motor. skin 
He's going and chipping at everyone all mm-hmm. game. He's got a high motor. He's kind of showboaty. Takes but a couple of these here and there. Yep. Yep. So. so we'll see what these protected player lists look like. We'll see if there's more trades coming. There probably will be. I feel like with two teams coming in, you're almost guaranteed people are shuffling like it was with Vegas last year coming into the NHL. Mm-hmm. People are trying to shuffle and make sure they don't lose anyone for free. Yep. Yep. Justin, anything else exciting going on in your life? No. Never. That's it? Wow. Well, that was worth a shot. Nothing exciting. Let's go home. I'm already home. <laughs> Is that your nice way of telling me to get the fuck out of your house? Nah. No. Well, I enjoyed you. today. I liked how much hockey we got to talk. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a, we'll have a couple, I feel like I'll have a couple more good hockey podcasts before the Bills even really kick into anything interesting. Uh, Bill was here, we would have argued. He was not happy that I wasn't happy with the O'Reilly trade. <laughs> He's going to, our Slack chat tomorrow is going to be blown up with Bill telling us how disappointed he is that we didn't eviscerate your O'Reilly takes. I think I explained myself well here today. I was just. You did fine. You ne- you needed the day to digest and actually come with it. I get it. Well, I was, I, it's, I don't come it's, across. It's not, it's not an in the moment reaction. Yeah. All right, let's get out of here. All right, thanks for listening, night, everyone. Guys. Follow us on the internet. On Twitter. At 716 Sport Podcast. Yeah, we're only allowed one sport at a time. Yes. If we ever tweet about the Bills and the Sabres, you can report our account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, find us on Facebook. Find yep. us on Podbean. As and a... Google Play. We're in the Google Store. Subscribe. Or the radio. Don't just find us. App. Subscribe. Subscribe. Subscribe on Apple Podcast. Click that anyway. subscribe button, fam. For that hot content coming to you sometimes when we feel like it, mostly. (laughs) All right. Goodbye, everybody. Good night.